welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Mad in America podcast. I'm Emmeline Friedman, independent psychosocial researcher and tech activist. Today, I'm very excited to be speaking with Hannah Zeven. Dr. Zeven is a lecturer in the Department of English and History at the University of California, Berkeley, and affiliated with the Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. She's also a visiting fellow at the Columbia University Center for the Study of Social Difference. She received her PhD from the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU in 2018. Her first book, The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy, is coming through the MIT Press this summer. Zeven serves as an editorial associate and author for numerous publications, including the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. She's also a co-founder of the Science, Technology, and Society Futures Initiative. So, Hannah, your journey has spanned topics in psychology, technology, media, and society. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and the interests that have shaped your career so far? Well, thank you so much, Emmeline, and thank you so much for having me. So I've had longstanding investments in thinking about media and mediation, uh, the technology that's charged with carrying intimate relation, and both the psychological work that media and technology do, as well as their tangible use in our healthcare landscape, and particularly, of course, our mental healthcare landscape. So I was lucky enough to earn a PhD in amazing uh, pluralistic department, which you mentioned the NYU Department of Media, Culture and Communication, which allowed me to really think about these problems synthetically as one problem with all of these multiple components. And in parallel, I've been involved with American psychoanalysis and publishing. Uh, I used to work as the managing editor for the Psychoanalytic Quarterly. And now, as you said, um, I'm the editorial associate of JAPA. Um, I was also trained to work on a crisis hotline uh, and have volunteered on and off at that hotline for about six years, a hotline here in the Bay Area, which really deeply inflected uh, the ways in which I approached this work uh, critically and as a scholar. So in all of my work, I'm interested in investigating special cases of mediated communication and technology. In my first book, the relationship under consideration is between patient and therapist and media. And I wanted to look at a very particular litmus, uh, both case and test, in order to think more fully and generally about mediated human relationality in other contexts. And my next book, which is called Mother's Little Helpers, uh, Technology in the American Family, thinks about just that, technology in the relationship between parent and child, also across uh, more than a century. Um, And I might say, additionally, I'm committed to questioning forms of relationality that we might approach as um, a moral good, like notions of intimacy or care or even empathy, to see uh, what these ways of coming together uh, allow us to have, of course, but also what they might conceal and carry and fully instruct. So teletherapy is also a case that I use to think through questions of how we are with each other and to each other in these modes of interaction. Yeah, teletherapy really seems like sort of like a perfect marriage between uh, media theory and perhaps even the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition. So I'm curious how you would describe um, your contribution to the history of psychotherapy. This is such a a wonderful and, of course, um, intense question. But um, my first book, The Distance Cure, History of Teletherapy, which will be out later this year from MIT Press, but is already available now for pre-order, is is probably the formal site of this contribution, more or less, though I have other writing that's not duplicated in the book that's around its edges. Um, And uh, there, I think about the relationship between therapists, broadly defined, and patients and media. In the book, in here, come the contributions, I revise our idea of the therapeutic dyad to argue that we are always working in some version of that triad, patients, therapists, and media and or technology. So that's a major revision to the notion of clinical practice and its premise, which uh, is deeply uh, premised on this idea of it being just people in a room and that that could be considered a pure or unmediated encounter. I I disagree. Uh, I reframe it as always being present, that triad. 
And then the distance cure makes a few additional interventions by examining the therapist and their patient working at distance from one another. Globally, it retells the history of clinical psychology via its shadow form, teletherapy. So instead of this being a recent concern, teletherapy, and also I'll say telemedicine, uh, which is not um, necessarily a, a major focus of the book, but is always at its edges, have been about to make their grand debut for a hundred years, say. And we've been, you know, um, legislating in front of that and uh, forecasting both great advancement as well as spelling doom for about a hundred years or more. It turns out also in the book, uh, and this is another contribution, I hope, that teletherapy is as old as therapy itself. So in the first chapter of the book, I argue that psychoanalysis and teleanalysis are co-currently brought to the fore by Sigmund Freud, uh, not because he was thinking about media metaphorically, which he was quite famously, but in his real use of media to treat patients at a distance, starting with himself in, in his so-called self-analysis which I argue is just a teleanalysis, and eventually with uh, his first and only child patient, who's referred to as Little Hans, uh, who was seen in the office once, but was treated otherwise via letter writing. Then the book takes uh, these uh, extraordinary and vulnerable uh, relationships between therapist and patient to explore what forms of intimacy, knowable and ignoble, are possible in these configurations. So just to dilate a little bit, I argue that since Freud stopped laying hands on his patients as part of hypnosis, which was uh, uh, you know, the turn to talking, some intervening distance has always been present between patient and therapist, even in the room. Then I proceed to look at how patients and therapists have bridged that distance in order for communication to happen at all. So, um, you know, of course, teletherapy uh, and the relationships, you know, contained in there uh, physically literalize that separation, even as they work extremely hard to diminish it. So as I conducted my research in order to make a critical history of teletherapy, starting in 1890, going right up to our present, uh, it turns out that teletherapy almost always attends crisis. And crisis almost always attends teletherapy. So the, the crises in the book that I look at include uh, World War I and the Spanish uh, influenza pandemic, World War II, the war for liberation in Algeria, uh, a suicide epidemic in San Francisco, and on and on, all the way to our contemporary pandemic unfolding right now. And while these cases are each quite different from one another, I unite them by making the claim that subtends the whole book, which is that distance isn't the opposite of presence, absence is. So the entire book is focused on asking if tele isn't an absence or a loss, what is it? The book elaborates various forms of what I call distanced intimacy, which is another contribution, I hope. Uh, instead of assuming tele is always a hopelessly lesser form of care, although it certainly can be, I investigate this real 130-year-long history of this form to upend that as a base assumption. Uh, and lastly, I think I dehomogenize how we think about teletherapy. I'm interested in many media forms and usage across this time period, not just on the one hand, private practice therapists doing Zoom or apps for the iPhone, um, but instead I try and restore the long history of teletherapy uh, in order to um, think about it more holistically, let's say. Yeah, so I really, really appreciate what I consider a sort of naturalization of teletherapy in your work in that you present uh, distance therapy as sort of always, or distance as always being an integral part of therapy in dialectic with absence, of course. Is it useful or have you found in conversation frequently that you sort of are able to use these arguments to speak to the panic around distance therapy? Yeah, I, I would say that that has been a really productive um, thing that I've been able to do uh, over the course of the last year, especially. Um, but, you know, people, clinicians, patients were really worried that um, I think especially because the appification of mental health care 
rightfully gets a lot of attention, that we're moving in a a direction that rescinds the availability of the in-person scenario. And so that teletherapy and that, that very cherished way of working together are often put at odds from one another. Um, and one thing that the book sort of, I think, gently tries to do is show that not only do these cases usually go together, but where distance is everywhere, such as in our current moment, that uh, teletherapy is not um, in contradistinction to in-person therapy because there is no in-person therapy or very little. Um, and so that is also a way of moving past that moment of panic um, and trying to move away from, yeah, in general, moral panic to think more clearly about what might be happening. Um, of course, I think we all know just anecdotally that panicking can make it hard to think. Um, and so I think just by stepping a little bit away from that edge, um, then we can discuss, you know, this question more, more fully. So are there medium specific contradictions of therapy that we should be aware of? Sure. Um, well, the book contends that media technologies have always played a central and sometimes alarming, right, no doubt, role in these intimate relationships. And I do consider medium-specific forms of relating that allow for unexpected and new, uh, bracketing good or bad, but unexpected and new kinds of human-to-human -human connection. So care is going to look very different when it's being offered contingently and anonymously via the phone in San Francisco in the 1960s, then it's going to look uh, in the hands of an analyst and their patient who've been working together five times a week for a decade or more. Um, but the book asks us to really sit with each of these scenarios uh, and not just write, especially the ones that might be thought of as paratherapeutic or activist-based care, not just writing them off as emergency care in which nothing really happens or only bad things happen. Um, of course, I've written elsewhere about these lineages of, say, the crisis hotline and how they flow into contemporary suicide hotlines and policing where, you know, lethal things do happen. And I think that's really important to draw our attention to, too. Um, in the quota of the book, I also try and think about the excess of intimacy or too much intimacy that can be encountered in teletherapy. Because again, one thing that comes up a lot in the literature on teleforms of relating is loss, loss of intimacy, loss of empathy, loss of understanding. Um, and I also think it's important to reframe these critiques uh, that situ situate teletherapy as lesser, as also pointing out perhaps that it can be too much. Um, and that, again, uh, depends on the medium and the person and the other person. Um, just as one example, I have a colleague who told me that teletherapy, which he's only practiced in the pandemic, feels like telepathy because of the use of noise-canceling headphones. And in fact, there's like a little Easter egg throughout the book, which is that again and again and again, telepathy comes up in conjunction with teletherapy throughout its long history, whether that's Turing or Freud uh, being extremely worried or my, my colleague here in the Bay Area. Yeah, I'm even thinking now of um, Zoom facilitation where inevitably the facilitator says, you know, Hannah, are you here with us? Can you hear us? Um, <laughs> and there's certainly a sort of mediumship involved in that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's a really great example. Uh, and, you know, this is also something that I'm invested in, especially at the end of the book, which is thinking about what the medium outside, I call it, the real infrastructural mediums uh, in, co you know, quotidian habitual use do and how they interact with what I call the medium inside. Um, and so, you know, there's, uh, we, we know in this, and, and in fact, Emily, we were just speaking about this before, right? The Chris Gilliard, I, you know, notion of digital redlining, that access to technology is deeply uneven in this country and beyond this country. Um, and that, you know, calls do drop, uh, Zooms do freeze. And um, one of the things that I've I've begun to work on and notice towards the end of writing this book, and that will I will carry on beyond, is how that makes individuals feel 
differently. And that's a a medium specific, but it's also an individual specific thing, how we react to the call dropping in therapy. Um, You know, not just in the, uh, can you hear me now sense of the AT&T ad, but somewhere deeply inside. Sure, sure. I kind of consider that as like the uncanny of of digital media. Absolutely. So I want to go back to, um, you know, you, you mentioned that you really took pains to bracket out the sort of good or bad for or against. And I have to say that the book really reads as a balanced approach to the evolution of distance therapy. And yet, I think it's important to talk about the fact that You know, a lot of practitioners would probably bristle at your description of the Talkspace app, where you describe how the immediacy um, that consumers come to expect from social media apps comes to actually substitute for a lot of the facets of, of the therapeutic alliance traditionally. Yeah. I mean, I bristle at it too, right? Um, My description is what's there. And I think I make it rather clear in the book, uh, especially in its last two chapters, uh, that I'm very worried. uh, And worried is too soft a word about the slippage where we call the patient a user or perhaps worse, a consumer, even though, of course, therapy under capital is consumed. And that's probably the start and the end also of the set of problems, though there's much in between. Um, the the turn to the appification of mental health care and the uberization of the mental health profession uh, is deeply troublesome. We're in a moment of massive job loss, as just one example. And many of these apps are marketed not to individuals, although Talkspace is, um, but to employers and are, quote unquote, disrupting mental health care therein. But these platforms are also constantly collapsing wellness and, say, economic productivity, addressing themselves to the crisis labor always is, but only just enough to resume from their point of view, again, not mine, the right kind of labor, the right kind of productivity. And we're seeing this all the time in the pandemic uh, when CEOs or CFOs speak about these apps. Often, not always, but often the logic is, We in the U.S. lose X billion dollars annually from depression. Uh, And, you know, if we had an app for that, that would be good. Right. And so it's part of that that framing uh, that is endemic in Silicon Valley, but not just here. Um, If we had an app for it or if we could disrupt it, then we could fix it. And there's no complete right workable system for, say, insurance and mental health care, because insurance is so also tied to employers. Um, Thus, the mental health, you know, quote unquote, industry, which is what uh, those in Silicon Valley call it, is ready for this, you know, disruption in this quote unquote space, uh, right? And these are the the kind of buzzwords that I hear a lot. Um, and another problem is, uh, is what is expected of those employed to do the caring therapeutic labor on those platforms. And, you know, journalists Kashmir Hill of the New York Times and Molly Fisher of New York Magazine have most recently done pretty deep investigations into what the clinician experience might be. And we have to care about that too. Uh, I care, you know, very first and foremost about patients in this book and in my life, but I also care about therapeutic labor. Um, And then of course, lastly, for the patient, right? A high level of care at a lower price is what's on offer, even if it's packaged differently, right? But that is what subtends uh, these apps. And that is what the disruption might be. And there's endless anecdotal evidence that whether it's the gender preference of the therapist uh, or their cultural cultural uh, competencies or a promise of on-demand care or a promise of just general availability, these things in general just don't come to fruition and then they hurt everyone, right? So if someone's in the point of needing care, um, especially in this country, in this context, and seeking it, uh, and then it is um, not delivered or misdelivered, that's a real problem. And there's relatively little oversight, right? Much as we as employees, or students might be told to use an app to uh, achieve wellness, whatever that might be, and mind our own wellness, um, which is this really unfortunate um, 
defanging of the the political notions of self care, right, and just uh, you know turned into a hashtag. Uh, that language itself skirts therapy on purpose, right? If the intervention is wellness or care or companionship or coaching, uh, it might do something good or bad, but it's not therapy and it's not being regulated as such. Yeah, it certainly isn't. And I feel like the big the big piece of this is that, you know, the immediacy and the the high, the offer that perhaps cannot be met, um, you know, for this high quality of care at a lower price. Um, it seems to surround the fact that the immediacy expectation really cuts both ways, right? So if we were to look at this as the precarization of mental health work, um, it would start to become apparent that when you sort of strip the reasonable or favorable working conditions of mental health workers, the quality of care also suffers, right? Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. And, you know, there are people uh, doing really important work on, in general, you know, Prop 22, um, which here in California, we've essentially just been the testing ground for this enshrining legally of what already is, which is this so-called, you know, the the most extreme version of the quote unquote gig economy and it's coming and has come for therapy as well. Um, so, you know, just, uh, you know, Elizabeth Cotton's work, uh, in the UK, which is posted under surviving work is really important for paying attention to not just what might be, but what is certainly already here. So if you could distill a little bit, um, the message to mental health workers in your book, what would it be? Thank you for this lovely question. I mean, so it it would depend on what one's reading for. Um, But, you know, in addition to this idea of thinking through um, the triad is always being there, um, you know, one one message to clinicians and mental health care workers working right now is that there are longstanding crises that we have to address in mental health care that aren't just because uh, we're here in a pandemic or just because we're at the, you know, the latest moment in late stage capital or just because of the application of mental health care. They, of course, look different in various contexts, whether that's the advent of Medicaid or the Community Mental Health uh, Care Act, or even in the 1940s with the Servicemen Readjustment Act, which is also popularly known as the GI Bill. Um, And, you know, that our current moment isn't the sum total of teletherapy, neither the emergency switch to Zoom a year ago or apps uh, that are under this mindfulness category on Google Play. Uh, I want us to be able to think more deeply about how we might relate over distance without feeling resigned to a future of corporate wellness initiatives, because there is a whole radical, careful history to teletherapy, starting with Freud himself, that can really point the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I totally agree. Um, I'm thinking also about um, what comes up in your book around mass intimacy and broadcast forms of, of mental health care delivery, um, as well as the challenges suicide and other hotlines posed to traditional therapy. And in my mind, this really coincides with um, sort of the confluence between the sort of care you know, coursing through social media platforms, possibly making them addictive, right? So I'm curious if there are facets of your work that you want to highlight that kind of hint toward a future in which care for the psyche is a little bit less sheathed, like a more open venture, perhaps even a non-commercial one. Right. Thank you so much. I mean, of course, this would be utopian. Um, And (laughs) also... On the other hand, it's always already existed, and so I have to hope it's to come. Um, But the book, I should just acknowledge, does end with a reference to the Shockwave Writer, which is, you know, a dystopian sci-fi novel uh, by John Brunner, and which, and the book has a complicated plot, (laughs) but within the, you know, the the sort of setting is a total control uh, by the government, 
And on the edges of, of that control also exist little forms of resistance. So in some ways, it's a, it's a pretty Foucauldian book. And one of them is called The Hearing Aid, which uh, though it's a fictional representation, and the book doesn't deal with any fictional representations of teletherapy, but for this one, um, really stuck with me the entire time I was writing the book. And that fictional form of care is called The Hearing Aid, uh, which is a, a collective of telephone service uh, operators reached at 999-999-9999. So it's called the hearing aid or 10 nines. And it works a lot like the crisis hotline in a way that I've worked on, which might be why it got so inside me. Um, and in the book, callers will scream into the hotline or they'll, you know, have a logorrheic episode where they're just like talking endlessly. Um, but also, um, you know, and here's a content warning around a suicidal ideation, you know, some callers in this book uh, use it as a witness, witnessing function as they, you know, take their own lives uh, because the, the dystopia is that extreme in this book. Okay. So telecare is imagined as functioning even at the bitterest of ends is what I take away from this. <laughs> that even in the most dystopian of societies, we understand that there will be some form of telehelp um, and that there is going to be a major difference between the real world and our real hotlines and crisis hotlines and this hearing aid, which is fictional, um, particularly because the hearing aid operators don't talk back to their callers, but they end each call with, quote, only I heard that. And that closing really struck with me um, because that space at the edge of, you know, you want to call it uh, the culmination of 500 years of the crisis of white supremacy or, you know, 500, 600 years of capital, um, that we are going to uh, take these various unique forms of communication in the midst of crisis and suffering and continue to need them. So that isn't what I would say a more open venture <laughs> in the sort of happy sense. Uh, but what I'm trying to suggest is even when we imagine the worst possible outcomes for our world, and you know, many argue we are living them, we also can imagine how we will navigate them psychically, even just a little bit together. And uh, so the things I'm excited by in my book are as I got to work, not when I started to write, but I realized across time, teletherapy up until COVID-19 is almost always free or low fee. Uh, mm -hmm. That also means we have to think about the ways in which uh, less good care might be pushed uh, onto communities already really vulnerable um, via sort of a quote unquote democratizing process, uh, you know, promise of access. And access again is one of these words I think we need to complicate and not just take at face value. Um, but you know, there are these uh, you know historical cases in my book uh, that talk about. Uh, communities doing it for themselves, either that scale or don't, where care is articulated specifically and towards actual people and their actual needs. Um, and so whether it's those historical cases in the book or the revived interest in the, you know, longstanding tradition of mutual aid during the pandemic, or mm -hmm. even apps that are being made by, by people like the artist Rashad Newsom, who's work at work right now on something called the Being app, which is a direct response to, um, you know, uh, rage and depression that Black communities have faced and are facing in the wake of police murders and racial aggression. I, I do think that um, there are discrete examples of how we can be together that don't rely on this notion of, quote unquote, purity and only ever in person, although that's great, too. Right. So contra the notion of purity of the, the psychoanalytic dyad, for example, sort of delivering the highest standard of care and real intimacy, um, there's kind of a way to complicate that, it seems, by looking at, you know, care as a bottom up process that happens with, you know, grassroots tech creation and, and mutual aid, like you said. And, you know, and there's also a history of, of psychoanalysis that is profoundly tied into the rise of late stage consumer capitalism, right? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about, about the fact that psychoanalysts have often been you know, big commentators on media, um, but that their theories have had really profound impact in advertising. 
right? So obviously the, the Edward Bernays sort of history um, looms, looms pretty largely. Right. So, um, so shifting gears a little bit, then I'm curious, what in your mind does psychoanalysis have to offer today to the larger digital media landscape? This is a great question. Um, well, I think it still has to offer what it's always offered, which is a way of navigating the psychical effects, both fantastical and fantasized and real of what's put into us. And, you know, digital media is now deeply part of that and has been for quite some time. So there's a really incredible, incredible work on the psychical effects of new media and digital media. Um, you know, Jacob Johansson, Alessandra Lemma, Aaron Balick, uh, Patricia Clue, um, who have all discussed similar questions of, uh, you know, to, to this framing of the unconscious and contemporary digital media um, especially the, you know, the recent book, The User Unconscious by, by Clue. Um, and uh, each of these thinkers are working really different ways. Um, you know, Lemma is a psychoanalyst in, in England, and really they're all uh, fantastic thinkers. Um, but I think I'm purposefully misunderstanding your question, which is less about diagnosis of the landscape and what it's doing to us and more about becoming part of it. Um, and that I will demur on because they need no help. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to ask because I've noticed little sprinkles of, of feminist scholarship across your work. Um, I'm curious because, you know, other feminist scholars of technology are apt to point out again and again that that women sort of play this unacknowledged historical role basically as pioneers in computing um, and tech adoption. Um, and I know that your, you know, your your next next book kind of <laughs> looks at looks at um technology uptake in in the familial setting. Um, and so I wondered if you want to talk a little bit about that. And you know, with it, um, if there are gender differentials that you that you want our listeners to be aware of um, in this whole technological landscape that we've been describing. Great, thank you so much. So, yeah, I mean, so fe feminist theory and feminist media history and feminist histories of technology are are deeply at the center of how I think uh, feminist you know, science and technology studies uh, is deeply at the center of how I was trained. Um, so thank you for, you know, even though I think it can seem as uh, outside the scope of mental health care, for me, it is not. So the, the next book is called Mother's Little Helpers, Technology in the American Family. It's also coming out from MIT, but in some years. Um, and uh, that book is really very focused on, you know, the ideas of maternal absence and presence and medical redlining as they interrelate to the real use of technologies in families or not. Um, because I also deal with um, the, you know, media refusal and technology refusal in the book as well. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of mental health care, yes, I mean, I think we can say that part of the story is, and we've already touched on this a little bit, but the feminization of, of therapeutic labor and the masculinization of technological and clerical work, right, following the work of, you know, what comes first to mind is of Mar Hicks, mm -hmm. uh, who is just a amazing scholar um, and their work uh, in their book, um, Programmed Inequality, is fantastic. Uh, and all of this is doubly crucial to the history of teletherapy. And, um, you know, the book really does tell a story that's not just a chronology, but um, of the increased turn to whether it's um, de-expertise or de-quote-unquote skilling, although I, I sort of push back against that, of yeah. the therapeutic encounter um, across, you know, the whole history of the 20th century past the heyday of Freud. And the book does not only deal at all with psychoanalysis. Um, and that, that feminization of therapeutic labor um, also means that women were, you know, increasingly becoming therapists and psychoanalysts, but it also is part of the story of the uberization uh, of therapy that, you know, people like Dr. Cotton are working on and doing really important studies and advocacy on and for as protections. And also the Psychotherapy Action Network in Chicago is addressing these questions head on as well. Uh, and of course, beyond 
beyond teletherapy, but within it, care can function as a cover for capture and control. And that stuff impacts us all is following Fred Moden, however, unevenly. So of course, gender is, you know, a huge question. Um, but so are things like race and class and ability and sanism. Uh, in this area and uh, how social change via the new technology interacts with the psyche and the body and the individual is all grounded in questions of what's happening more systemically beyond the individual in society. Absolutely. I mean, this is really, this is really the nub of it for me is that um, your work is very inspiring in the sense that it explores sort of all of the ins and outs of care and what one might call therapeutic labor, you know, as it relates to media and technology, both in and out of mental health work, right? There's a sense in which the media landscape of which we're all a part sort of pushes society more broadly or as a whole to think about um, sort of changes to to the psyche, basically, um, and forms of care that come with those. So this has been really fantastic, Hannah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.